MedCram.com. Well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. We've got another EKG that we want to go over. And with this case, this is a patient that presents to the emergency room via ambulance for chest pain that's been going on for about 45 minutes. And this is the EKG that is done in the field. You quickly review it. And you notice that there is a report from the field of a ST segment depression here in the precordial leads. Now, this was done about 10 minutes ago. The patient is quickly moved into another room, and an EKG is done. And here is the EKG that you get. Let's go through our evaluation as we go through this. Remember our five-step process here? The first thing that we want to look at is rate. We can pick the easiest place to look at, which is the QRS complex here. For instance, we'll look at these two. And we can see here clearly that we've got one box, two boxes, three boxes, and then four, and maybe a little bit extra. Again, let's look at another one up here. We can look at it here. One, two, three, four, and a little bit more. So as we're looking at that, remember we go through the count. The first box is going to be 300. The second box is going to be 150. The third box is going to be 100. The fourth box is going to be 75. And so this is going to be somewhere between 60 and 75. So we can come up with something, for instance, 70. Now, if we look over here on the other side of the page, we can see clearly, if we count it through, that we've got one, two, three, four, five boxes. So here it's going to be 300, 150, 100, 75, and then finally 60 over here on this side. So whereas over here, it's probably around 70, over here, it's probably more around 60. And it looks as though something happened right about here where there was a change. Now, remember that the entire strip is about 10 seconds. And so if we count up the number of QRS complexes and multiply it by six, we'll get how many complexes there are in about a minute. So let's take a look here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So multiply ten, probably in a little bit more here, times six, and we're going to get a little bit more than sixty, somewhere between sixty and seventy, which is exactly what we come up with. So for us, the rate is somewhere between sixty and seventy beats per minute. All right, next, let's go on to rhythm. So the best lead to look for rhythm is Roman lead two. And that's this one down here. Usually it's the rhythm strip, and that's aptly named that way. So we're gonna look for each QRS complex here, and we're gonna look to see before the QRS complex if we see P waves. And we can clearly see P waves before each QRS complex. Here's another QRS complex, here's the P wave. QRS, P wave. We don't see extra P waves, although there is this little extra beat here, and you probably can figure out what that is. That's probably a U wave, sometimes associated with low potassium. But clearly we see here that there is P waves before each QRS complex, and so we're gonna call this sinus rhythm. Great. Next, let's look at axis. So again, like we talked about in previous videos, you can look at these leads here and see which one is the most positive and the highest in amplitude. And in this case, the one that we're looking at here is Roman numeral lead 2. You can see that it's the highest in amplitude. So remember the direction. Remember 2 is going down sharply in this direction, whereas 3 is going down sharply in this direction. AVL is going to the left-hand side, and so it's going to be going up in this direction. AVF, of course, is going straight down, 
Roman lead one is going straight across and AVR, of course, is going off at that type of an angle. So if we see that the highest one here is going in this direction, then that's the closest to where it's going. Now, the other way of looking at this is to see which one is the most isoelectric. And we can see here with lead one that that seems to be the most isoelectric. So it's gonna be very perpendicular to Roman numeral lead one because it's isoelectric, but it's gonna be going almost parallel to Roman numeral lead two. And so in fact, the probable way that this is going is in this direction. Now, if that's the case, it should be positive in lead three because it's going almost in the same direction and that's the case. Since it's going almost parallel to AVF, it should also be positive and in fact, it is. Now, because it's going almost in the opposite direction to AVL, this is going down and this is going up, it should be negative and it is, but it should be the most negative when compared to AVR because it's going almost in the opposite direction and that's where you have the biggest negative discharge. So the overall axis, if we consider that this is zero degrees here, somewhere between 60 and 90 degrees. And that takes care of axis. Let's move on to hypertrophy. So again, the big things that we're looking for for hypertrophy is the right atrium. And for the right atrium, we look at Roman numeral lead two, but we could also look at precordial lead V1. And we're looking at whether or not there is a large up and a small down, or whether or not there is a small up and large down. The big up, remember, is the right atrium, and the big down is the left atrium. And of course, we're not seeing that here. We don't see that in lead one. So let's start from the beginning. Right atrium should have a peaked P wave. We don't see that there. Right atrium should also have a large positive component in the P wave in lead V1. We don't see that. So right atrium is a negative. Let's go on to left atrium. As we mentioned, the left atrium should have a large negative deflection. We may be seeing that a little bit here, but it's gotta be bigger than a box. So we're not seeing that much. So no on the left atrium. Now the right ventricle, we also look at lead V1. And in lead V1, we should have a R wave, the positive component of, of this, that is bigger than the S wave. And that is actually looking like we might actually have that. If we measure this out, we can see that the R wave may be slightly larger than the S wave. So we may have some right ventricular hypertrophy here. It also looks like we've got a little bit of a bundle branch block pattern here as well. Now let's go to the left ventricular criteria. Now for that, we need to look at the S wave in lead V1. And here it's about five millimeters. And we also need to look at the R wave in lead V5. And here we're looking at five, 10, 15, 20. So that's five times one, two, three, four. So here we have about 20. So we add the 20 millimeters and the five millimeters together and we come up with 25. However, that's still not enough for the criteria of 35, which is what the criteria is for left ventricular hypertrophy. So after all of that, we have some questionable RV hypertrophy. Good. Now let's go on to ST segment. I think we can all clearly see that we've got some ST segment elevation in the precordial leads, whereas before when the patient first came in to the emergency room, there was some ST segment depression. Now there's ST segment elevation. If you look back at the first EKG, you'll notice something that's really interesting. 
In AVR specifically, AVR is a very specific lead, and it's important in that it looks directly at the endocardium. Notice here very carefully that you actually see some ST segment elevation, although it is mild. This ST segment elevation usually means in AVR that myocardial injury is incipient, it's coming. It's an ST elevation MI precursor, if you will. So if you see this ST segment elevation, be very, very concerned. And you can see here that this is kind of giving it away in the sense that you've got precordial leads with ST segment depression, and you've got this AVR with ST segment elevation. Now, be aware that if you see ST segment depression in AVR, that along with tachycardia is usually gonna mean pericarditis but that's not what we see here. We see ST segment elevation. And now on the second EKG, notice in addition to our ST segment elevation that we already talked about, look here again, AVR with significant ST segment elevation. And this in the appropriate clinical setting, which is what we typically see, is consistent with and concerning for an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. So generally what you want to see is two contiguous leads with greater than one millimeter ST segment elevation. Um, the criteria actually for V2 and for V3 is actually a little bit more stringent. And for men that are 40 plus, the criteria is actually two millimeters. And for men that are less than 40, it's even more stringent at 2.5 millimeters. For women, it's actually just 1.5 millimeters. And here, depending on where you draw the baseline, there is maybe not quite 2.5 millimeters, um, but certainly on its way to being that in this patient. And if you look at some other criteria here with V1 and also what we talked about with uh, AVR, this is highly suggestive of myocardial injury. Now, because these are in the precordial leads, we're looking at right ventricular, precordial, and anterior left ventricular. Notice we don't see them going over to the lateral leads here. And so the answer here is yes, there is elevation, and that is consistent with a ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Okay, let's briefly talk about the management of this. Because this patient has a myocardial infarction, the patient needs reperfusion therapy. And this can come in two different ways. One is through what we call PCI, percutaneous catheterization, otherwise known as percutaneous coronary intervention. And the other is thrombolytics. And this should be considered if the patient doesn't have any contraindications and if the patient's been having chest pain for less than 12 hours. Now, you should know that PCI is considered to be the superior technique. Now, there's two different options. Number one is that you have PCI at your facility. And the other option is that you don't have PCI. Now, if you have PCI, the goal is to get your patient to the cath lab and have them inserting the catheter in 90 minutes. That is a key number that you should be aware of. If you don't have a cath lab, then you need to get them there within 120 minutes. That is another number that you should be aware of, is the 120 minute number. The reason why this is important to understand is that if you cannot do this, if you cannot get the patient to either your cath lab in 90 minutes or another hospital's cath lab in 120 minutes, then the other alternative to do is thrombolytics. Now, you may still have to transfer the patient for rescue percutaneous coronary intervention, but in terms of primary PCI, you need to know those numbers because that is the treatment for this. And be aware of the contraindications for thrombolysis, which we won't get into in this lecture. <laughs>
Thank you for joining us. 